Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, pursuant to House Rule 10.01, I call this remote meeting of the House Preventing Home Division to order. Um, the clerk, Mr. Petrie, will take the roll to determine which members are present. Chair Gomez. Present. Gomez present. Keeler. Keeler present. Keeler present. New Brindley. Present. New Brindley present. Davids. Davids present. Davids present. Heinrich. Heinrich present. Heinrich present. Hollins. Hornstein. Hornstein present. Hornstein present. Howard. Present. Howard present. Kegel. Present. Kegel present. Petersburg. Present. Petersburg present. Ryer. Present. Ryer present. And we do have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, next is the approval of the minutes. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes for March 17th, 2021? I'll move. <laughs> All right. I heard uh, Representative Ryer um, is moving approval of the minutes for March 17th, 2021. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, if we could uh, briefly unmute to take a voice vote. Uh, those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails and the minutes for March 17th, 2021 are adopted. All right, so thanks for being here, everyone. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit more. You know, we talked a couple of weeks ago when I presented the Housing First for Kids tax aid bill um, about youth kind of school age homelessness of children living with their parents. and. Today, we're gonna to delve into um, this kind of other population that's folks who are under 24 and who are unaccompanied, you know, young people experiencing homelessness. Um, we have, we're kind of going at it from a couple different directions. Um, you know, first up, we have uh, Dr. Stephen Foldis, who's here with us. Um, he is recognized for creating and leading successful multidisciplinary research um, projects in business and government. He um, is an adjunct associate professor in the Division of Epidemiology and Community Health at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. Um, I actually like when I presented the Housing First for Kids um, credit or uh, aid in the tax committee, I had him come with me, even though his research is really about these, um, the kind of unaccompanied youth demographic um, the research that he's going to present to us today. But I, I think that that one of the things that we've talked about in this committee and try, have, have, that we've been trying to, to understand is like, what's the cost of not intervening, um, especially when, when, our, when our children and youth are experiencing homelessness. Um, so, so he has some really interesting research that he's going to present about that. Um, and that's how we're going to start off today. So Dr. Foldis, welcome to the committee. Thank you so much for joining us. If you want to just introduce yourself and then we'll, we'll take a look at your slides and go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, Chair Gomez. Um, as you said, my name is Stephen Foldis. I'm an independent research consultant and an adjunct associate professor of epidemiology and community health at the University of uh, Minnesota. I'm going to share my screen. So I'm here today to describe what I think is a compelling business case for public expenditures to prevent youth homelessness, an opportunity that is not well understood. Why? Because until very recently, we have been unaware of the comprehensive long-term cost to taxpayers of homelessness. Together with an economist, I conducted a study of these costs for a sample of 1,451 unaccompanied homeless youth in Minneapolis that I'll review very briefly. But before I get to the numbers, I'd like to share one of our surprising findings. As we went from one office to another to gather data on these costs, we found that staff could certainly identify what their agency spent in the last year or two on the specific services that they provided to the youth we studied. But no one could say what their agency spent on them over a lifetime. No one would even hazard a guess 
about what all of the other agencies that provided various services to these youth spent on them. So the comprehensive long-term cost of homelessness is just not known, even among those who are most directly involved. We added up the comprehensive taxpayer burden across multiple agencies and over a lifetime, building on an approach developed by Clive Belfield, an economist, and two of his colleagues. Their, their groundbreaking research was conducted in 2012 for the White House Council for Community Solutions, supported by the Kellogg Foundation. The council asked Belfield to estimate how many youth in America, ages 16 to 24, are disconnected from education and employment during these critical growth years, at a time when others of their age are building the knowledge, the skills, and the social capital that will equip them to become productive taxpaying citizens. The council also asked Belfield to estimate the lifetime cost burden of these youth to taxpayers. We learned for the first time from Belfield and his colleagues that there were some 6.74 million disconnected youth in 2011, fully 17% of all youth in the age range of 16 to 24. Belfield called them opportunity youth. Belfield estimated that the aggregate taxpayer burden for each cohort of opportunity youth over their lives from age 16 to, 20, 16 to 64 to be over $1.56 trillion in present value terms. In 2021 dollars, that's nearly 1.9 trillion, the cost of the American Rescue Plan stimulus bill. But unlike the stimulus, these costs roll over each year because each year brings a new cohort of opportunity youth. The cohort of youth ages 16 to 24 that we studied visited YouthLink in 2011. YouthLink is Minneapolis's largest drop-in center for homeless youth and has operated for over 40 years in downtown. It is a key part of the safety net for nearly 2,000 youth each year who experience homelessness in this area. In 2019, YouthLink's budget was $5.2 million. It's funded by a mix of federal, state, county, and city sources, together with foundations, the United Way, and corporate and individual contributors. YouthLink is one of the largest in Minnesota, but it is only one of many that offer youth a safe space off of the streets. Some youth drop in just once, others many times and some become heavily involved over several years. YouthLink helps them meet their immediate basic needs, hot meals, showers, hygiene products, laundry facilities, a food shelf, a clothing closet, access to a computer, and a health clinic on site. Like other uh, drop-in centers, YouthLink's special sauce is its experienced staff of case managers, and outreach workers who engage youth without judgment and steer them toward mental health and chemical dependency services, supportive housing, education, and hopefully employment. Their mission is to support and empower young people on their journey to self-reliance. In 2011, YouthLink became the site of the Youth Opportunity Center, a collaborative service model that brings together more than 30 government and volunteer agencies to serve youth in one location at YouthLink, including organizations like Hennepin County, the Red Door Clinic, and Job Corps. YouthLink's drop-in center is not a shelter, but YouthLink staffs supportive housing beds in two locations, and with Project for Pride in Living, recently built a supportive housing facility on site, shown here. The youth in our study were experiencing homelessness or were at risk of becoming homeless, so they are a small subset of all opportunity youth. But they are where many youth end up when families fall apart 
and can no longer make it. Unsurprisingly, this cohort was 91% youth of color and 53% of those over age 18 had yet to complete high school. That makes these youth ground zero for racial disparities, the achievement gap in our schools, and for poverty and income inequality in our communities. Because of those things, they are examples of the impact of the social determinants of health and problems for public safety. So while our focus is on a small group of youth, this is a group whose existence has large implications for our society. Using Belfield's categories, we gather data from many local sources on this cohort's comprehensive costs in 2011. As you see, we estimated lost tax payments, excess public expenditures for crime, public spending for health services, welfare support programs, such as job training, welfare transfer payments, and education costs. We added a category for public support for housing, which Belfield did not have for his larger group of disconnected youth, who, although they are disconnected, usually are not homeless. Following Belfield, we also gathered additional costs incurred by society more broadly, such as lost earnings and the victim costs of crime. But these costs are not borne by taxpayers, so I'm not showing them here today. I don't have time for many details, but here is one simple example of how we filled in this table. Here are the number of cohort members who were eligible for general assistance, SNAP, and MFIP, and the cost of those benefits in total and per cohort member. Some other cost categories are less precise because data were not as directly available, so they required careful estimation. Here's the complete table showing the comprehensive excess costs to taxpayers for this cohort for one year. The bottom line is that total taxpayer costs for this cohort were nearly $30 million expressed in current dollars, or more than $20,000 per person. Keep in mind that I'm talking about 1,451 unaccompanied youth. And the Wilder Foundation estimated very conservatively that there were 7,500 such youth in Minnesota in 2018, before the pandemic. We transformed these annual costs for our cohort into costs over time in order to estimate the lifetime burden to taxpayers. The arrow represents age in years from 16 to 24, then to 64, where we relied on Belfield's data. As you see below the arrow, the lifetime taxpayer burden for this cohort is over $427 million, or nearly $300,000 per person, as shown above the arrow. Recall that these costs are expressed in present value, discounted at 3.5% per year. Next, we examine how much taxpayers spent on all interventions for the cohort in one year. Here are the categories of expenditures that we captured. We divided all of these expenditures into three basic categories. Basic needs, basic needs expenditures are intended to meet the day-to-day -day needs of these youth, such as welfare transfer payments, healthcare services, other than for mental health and chemical dependency treatment, temporary shelter, and youth links drop-in services. Housing expenditures share the goal of establishing housing stability. Examples include supportive housing, youth shelters, emergency assistance, and youth link services related to housing. Finally, transformative services are designed to help youth change their lives, as through mental health and chemical dependency treatment, education, welfare support programs such as job skills training, and case management by youth link and other staff. The total for one year of interventions was $22.1 million. Notice, however, less than half of these expenditures went for housing and transformative services, those services that we hope will help these youth change the trajectories of their lives. 
Now, knowing the taxpayer burden and the cost of interventions, we conducted a break-even analysis. And we asked, as you see here, how many youth would need to become financially self-sufficient at age 20 to offset the annual cost of all interventions for the entire cohort? Here's the answer. All 1,451 youth in the cohort are arrayed on the horizontal axis shown here. And each adds about $250,000 to the height of the line. That's the present value of what each will cost taxpayers from age 20 to 64. The slope reaches to more than $360 million. We learned that if 89 youth, just 6.1% of the cohort became self-sufficient at age 20, the savings to taxpayers would fund all of the interventions for the entire cohort. So we don't have to succeed with all or even half of these youth to break even. In fact, if we succeed in helping just one in five to end their dependence on taxpayer funded services, we would generate $50 million in savings to taxpayers above and beyond the annual cost of all services. Now, it is reasonable to ask if we can succeed with 6.1% of these youth. We should acknowledge that turning around the lives of these youth is a heavy lift. People seldom change as dramatically as assumed in this exercise. The reality is more complex and messy. Dr. Christine Peicher and I are leading a research team in the University's Center for Advanced Studies in Child Welfare, examining what happened to this cohort over many years, and we expect to have results to share this fall. But we already have plenty of anecdotal evidence that with appropriate resources, YouthLink and other such organizations can help youth change their lives. We know of many individual success stories. Take Jamie Nabosny, who was bullied in the 1990s in high school in Ashland for being gay to the point that he was hospitalized and required surgery. He left high school and landed at YouthLink, where he got help to put his life back together and to complete his GED. He went on to sue the Ashland School District in what became a landmark lawsuit. Jamie is now a vice president at Sunrise Bank. YouthLink data also show promising signs of progress toward reduced long-term dependency on taxpayer-funded services. I'm not going to review these in detail, but these data on case management services and youth who were in support of housing point to growing housing stability, educational attainment, and increased earnings. The photo shows YouthLink's annual celebration of high school completion. A key factor is that at this point in their lives, Many youth want desperately to succeed. They often arrive at YouthLink in crisis, hurt and angry and sorry for themselves. But over time, with the help of YouthLink's case managers, many of them begin to assess their circumstances, seek the help they need, and find that youthful energy to change their lives. As you saw, Half of what we, saw, we spent on them just supports their basic needs, not helping them change their lives. For each youth we help to succeed, we also reduce the achievement gap in our schools, the racial disparities in our communities and levels of poverty. We also improve public safety and the social determinants of health. We also, Equally important, provide workers to help the anticipated labor shortage in Minnesota. And not least, we improve the lives of many young people who have had a very rough start in their life journeys. That's why I believe this is a compelling business case. With such a low break even, this is a low risk investment. We can afford to be bold because the lifetime cost of inaction is enormous. 
So this is an outstanding investment opportunity, not only to help these young people, but to save ourselves as taxpayers a tremendous amount of money. Because of this, we should stop thinking about spending taxpayer dollars on preventing youth homelessness as charity or money down the drain, and think of it as an essential investment. But while compelling, this opportunity is not simple for two reasons. First, the cost of prevention is immediate and substantial, while the savings will accrue over many years and are less visible. It is always difficult to quantify expenditures that would have been spent, but were not spent due to prevention efforts. That doesn't mean that the savings are not real. They are real. Thanks to Art Rolnick's advocacy, many elected officials have come to appreciate this about early childhood education. This is analogous. This is a critical window of opportunity to prevent a lifetime of dependency on taxpayer funded services. Second, the costs I've described are spread over all levels of government and many different agencies, and its savings would also accrue, accrue variously to all of these entities. This makes it more challenging for any one level of government to justify making a large investment in prevention. The savings will come but they will be distributed across the budgets of many agencies and parts of government. Clearly, there is a compelling business case for investing in prevention in this area, but it will require a visionary group of leaders, leaders who see the big picture and take the long view to make this investment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Foldis, for um, sharing that information with us. Uh, I was really um, happy to get a little bit more in depth uh, on this issue. I think you, that your analysis really helps to bring together, um, you know, some of the complexities that we encounter um, in this area. And I especially appreciated kind of the, your last slide that was like spoke to the difficulty of figuring out how to account for this and how to think of the cost of inaction, which is something that we uh, grapple with in this committee a lot. So we have some member questions. Um, first is Representative Hornstein. Um, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Foldis, for this uh, excellent and thought-provoking uh, presentation. I, um, I think it's, it's very, very compelling. Um, you had said uh, at one point, um, you know, talked about the way in which um, groups like YouthLink and, and others could could succeed with, a, you said, quote unquote, appropriate resources. And, you know, I thought your analogy to early childhood education was a, a very, very good one because as you pointed out, uh, policymakers have been, you know, looking at the, the payback on that for, for many, many years. So to put this on the table, uh, I think now is especially timely. Um, and so my question is, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, presentation was titled The Business Case, and, um, and you, you laid that out quite well. And so have you presented this or had interaction with, with different business groups? You know, I know that when we talk about appropriate resources, uh, Chair Gomez and I have worked, you know, with others in the legislature about a more progressive tax system, uh, and some of our efforts are often met with um, uh, opposition uh, from various business groups. And um, you know, we know, I, I think, that there are enough resources to go around in the state if, if they were uh, raised and spent in a, a fairer way. So I'm wondering if, um, you know, have you been able to, to present this to, to business leaders and, and, and other civic leaders? And, and, and if so, what has their response been? Uh, Representative, Representative Hornstein, thank you for your question. Uh, yes, I have been able to present this. Um, this research was actually done several years ago, and when it first came out, it received some attention from the press. Um, and as a result, I received invitations from um, the Chamber of Commerce in several different places and made, the, uh, made a presentation about our results. 
I think everyone who was there seemed quite convinced and compelled by the results. Um, but obviously, not everyone has seen it. And this is like the uh, instance of Art Rolnick's research, something that needs a lot more exposure and discussion before it pervades our understanding. Uh, we have a, a big step to take in order to have this kind of approach appreciated broadly among policy leaders throughout the state. Um, and thank you, Madam Chair. And just one final quick comment. I completely agree with you, Dr. Fuldis. And you know, for those who may not be aware, um, you know, Dr. Fuldis' uh, research has led uh, to incredible results on in smoking cessation and uh, you know, that issue in particular uh, that took a while to, for, to coalesce, but then you know, once it did, we as a legislator and just the public in general were able to embrace it. So I hope your research here will result in some of the same accomplishments that uh, took place in the smoking area where, where you were a pioneer. So uh, maybe it's on all of us. And thank you, Madam Chair, for, for sharing this research. Maybe this is maybe a first step in terms of some legislative engagement with, with this research. So thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Dr. Foldis. Thank you so much, Representative Hornstein. Uh, next, Representative Cagle. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you. Um, I know Jamie, and I had no idea that that was his story or his background. Um, I met him through some of my work at um, in non in the nonprofit world, and um, seeing what he built at Sunrise as far as their um, social entrepreneur program and all of that. Um, I think that is, he's the perfect example of why investing in youth um, really makes a big difference. Um, and so when I saw his picture pop up there, I was really excited and um, popped up an email to him. And, um, you know, I would have never known that about him. Um, and I just, you know, he's got four kids and um, is, is uh, somebody who is probably paid it over multiple times back. Um, and so he definitely is a, the, the, you know, poster child for why this is a good idea. And if we can get 10 Jamie's or 20 Jamie's or make all of our kids Jamie's, then it would, um, this would be an amazing, um, investment. And so I just, I was really excited to see that. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Cagle. Um, that's like one of the cool things at the legislature, right? Is all these intersections that we find with our lives. Um, next up, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks so much for the presentation. Um, my question is, uh, and, and frankly, I think we've all long thought that there is a business case for this. Um, you know, you, you said on that last slide that prevention is hard to quantify and the cost is immediate and substantial. And you've done a good job of quantifying the costs over the life. I'm wondering <laughs> two very complicated questions. <laughs> um, have you quantified what you believe the investment needs to be right now and where that investment needs to be? Dr. Foldis? Um. Representative New Brindley, uh, no, I have not. I, I leave that question to the professionals involved in running these organizations and to you as legislators to make that determination. Um, but it is obvious that we need to invest more heavily because the more we invest and the more we succeed, the more we save. Representative New Brindley. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Ryer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Foldis. Uh, this is, is really interesting, and I'm thinking about a couple of different aspects. Uh, one is that uh, in the legislature, um, across the whole, uh, both all caucuses, there are many business-minded people. And so I think having this type of data really helps um, inform the stories that we can tell 
um, in our advocacy for the human side that preventing homelessness accomplishes. Um, the other thing that crosses my mind is that the diffuse responsibility, um, there are two factors, one or two outcomes of that. One is that in all of the committees that we're in, there is probably a tie to homelessness and preventing homelessness and youth. And we can be ambassadors of this information across all of those different forums uh, because there is so much here that could be uh, germanely brought into the conversation. Um, and the last thing I'd like to observe is that one of the reasons that the responsibility is so diffuse is because no two sets of needs are the same. No two homeless young person has the same need uh, in exactly the same mix. And so of course, uh, the solutions are found in different parts of um, policy making and uh, service delivery. So as we wrap our minds around that, it makes it more understandable uh, rather than saying, why can't we do it all in one place? It's of course it's not all in one place because expertise in education, in jobs, in housing, in mental health, in chemical dependency are all different disciplines. And so as we can wrap our minds around what all those are and put the pieces together, I think that we can um, tell a unified story. And Tergomas, I think this committee is uh, a key demonstration that we're seeing it that way and moving forward. So no question, just some reflections. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Representative Ryer. I like the idea of us all being ambassadors of this information in other places. Um, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and so uh, as looking as I start to look at and hear about what YouthLink does, it seems to me that that it it really kind of supports and develops um, some of the things that historically had been done by by families uh, previously. And so I, I'm in quite I'm kind of curious as to is there any kind of um, ge general view on on the family situation of, of the kids that are in homelessness, is there any way in which we can help intervene uh, prior to them getting to this level? Because obviously, the, the sooner they can learn some of the life skills and and the uh, uh, growth issues that occurred at youth links, um, the sooner we could intervene. Uh, seems to me that that would have even a, a better chance of impacting the homelessness as well. So I'm always looking at. At how can we help people before they even get to this spot uh, as a way to eliminate uh, the impact altogether? And I don't know if there's an answer. I, I'm just curious. Thank you for that, uh, Representative Petersburg. I know that we have, um, I'll <coughs> kick it to Dr. Foldis. We also have um, Dr. Heather um, Chusby from YouthLink on the line. Uh, and just to put in a plug, honestly, I mean, you know, the earlier the intervention, the better. So, um, you know, my my housing first for kids, uh, local uh, local tax aid is one thing we've talked about. In when we went to human services with that bill, we talked with with Representative Pinto about even earlier interventions. And I know that when we heard from Dr. Um, Mastin when I presented the bill that she talked about, you know, even before kids are in school, you know, those early years we know are really critical and and she even spoke about like, hey, maybe the right time to intervene is like when somebody's pregnant or like how do we stabilize people throughout those kind of experiences. So I'll, I'll kick it to Dr. Foldis and if Dr. Hughesby has anything to add. Thank you. Thank you, Representative uh, uh, Gomez and Peter Birch. Uh, let me just say that uh, I completely agree that going upstream is always better, but there is no question in my mind and I think in any of our minds, that there will always be some youth and some families that disintegrate and that don't work. Uh, Jamie Nabosny's family was one of those examples. His family completely fell apart and, uh, and he suffered a great deal in his school setting as well. So there are always going to be those, those kinds of situations. And that's why I call this ground zero. This is the sort of the end of the line. And what happens is that 
if we don't intervene effectively here, we are potentially facing a lifetime of dependency on taxpayer funded services. So that's, what, that's why uh, earlier intervention is better, but we should not ignore the fact that there are going to be some people who are in that situation and who we can help. Thank you, Dr. Fuldis. Uh, Dr. Hughesby, did you have anything to add? Yeah, Chair and Representative Hughesburg, um, I'm, I'm the Executive Director of YouthLink and I've been there 16 years. Um, and what I want to say is it's, it's both. And um, the, um, it is until we all come together at the table, um, uh, we serve, we're still serving over 1,700 youth a year. Um, and the 1,451 that doc, Dr. Fold has studied, since then, we're still seeing 1,700, 90% of them are black and brown youth. Um, there is a portion of them, the number one thing that the youth are saying, that the reason they're homeless is family dysfunction. That's the number one thing. Um, yes, early intervention would make some difference, but there's still some that have lost parents when they're born, they're taken away from their homes. Um, and so we're still gonna see those youth. We're still gonna see those youth at the far end. And too often what's been happening is they are forgotten, they're thrown away. And then we, if we don't inter, if we don't intervene right now, they are going to be part of the system forever. And so we have to intervene. But the earlier intervention is critical. And until we all systems get at the table and sit down and talk about that, we're still going to we're going to have them move on. And so there's it's both. We have to do both, and we have to do it better. Dr. Hughesby, um, the other thing I just wanted to add on the point of, you know, sort of talking about interventions that prevent, you know, a, a potential lifetime of public investment is that um, I'm just trying to think back I, to the wilder research that I looked at and, um, you know, people who experienced, who were experiencing homelessness as, adult, as an adult, um, I think it was 53% of them had experienced their first episode of homelessness before they were age, before they were 24 yes and a third when they were with their families and so you know that kind of speaks to this like if you know I think you're totally right like the earlier the better but if we don't deal with the reality of this population then we are kind of almost seven chair almost 70 percent of the youth that we ex we work with have had at least one adverse childhood um, experience and it's it's impacted their life and so um, and they're often their first case of homelessness is before they're 12 years old and so um, it's it the ex their their lifetime experience in homelessness is significant thank you so much any final thoughts representative petersburg um, uh, yes uh, absolutely so so here we we're hearing information from dr husby for example that um, 90 percent of the youth say it has to do with family dysfunction. Well, that's a pretty high trend. And it certainly indicates that we need to start thinking also about how we deal with family dysfunction and how do we e eliminate uh, some of that need? Uh, because I would guess that if you talk to the homeless in general, uh, that they would say it refers back to kind of the family dysfunction that is there. So to me, that's, that's clear indication that we also need to do that. Uh, and I agree, we can't, it's not one or the other, it has to be both, uh, absolutely. Uh, but the fact is that we, we tend to spend time on, uh, on ground zero, as Dr. Fold has said, uh, because that's easier for us to wrap our hands around and, and it's easy to just predict, way well, we gotta get them in, in homes, et cetera. But the reality is, is that we're, we are dealing with uh, what I think is a, is a crisis in, in family dysfunction. And, and uh, that needs to be addressed as well. And, and I just don't see us doing that right now, but I think it's something that we need to consider in the future. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Petersburg. Um, we're gonna move on to the next part of our committee now. Um, we are honored to be joined by Huang Murphy, who is the Executive Director of Foster Advocates. Um, Foster Advocates organizes individuals with connections to, what, to what child welfare systems 
to build power and the capacity of the foster care community. Um, they advocate with former foster youth and stakeholders at the county and state level to create the changes communities need. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Murphy. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair. My name is Juan Murphy. I'm excited to testify today. Um, just give me a moment as I set up my screen. Can everyone see the slide all right? Great. So I'll just jump right in. So my name is Huang Murphy. I'm the executive director and founder of Foster Advocates. It's a nonprofit that works with people who have experienced foster care to create policy change. And so it's not just our name, it's what we do. We foster ad advocacy, policy, uh, and organizing by working with fosters. So I added the slide just because I've realized that a lot of people just ask me why foster care? Um, and I think it's because they're shocked uh, usually that someone who experienced care is able to appear before them in a way that isn't presented in most media. So I'm the cute one on the right. My little brother is the cute one on the left and my late sister uh, is in the middle. But why foster care? I think it's rather obvious. It's because I was in care. I entered foster care when I was eight years old um, and I was later adopted when I was 11 and had the option of re-entering care uh, as an older youth. We'll talk more about that later. So we're going to see me say the word foster. Uh, I say foster mostly because, you know, we want to recognize that uh, the experience of being in foster care creates a unique cultural identity. We think it's a, akin to other mutable characteristics and that the impact of care just never ends. And so we use foster to name and claim that. So I really appreciate the commentary uh, today because I think it's just a perfect segue to the conversation that I want to have with all of you today, which is that when we talk about the state of care, when we talk about homeless youth and we talk about foster care, we're talking about a Venn diagram that is almost a complete circle. And so before we jump into that, however, I think that often we get lost into this idea that we can apply a similar model or the same thing across population groups. And so I think it would be helpful to have some background in this, you know, the state of foster care here in Minnesota. So one thing I'd like to mention is that, as many of you remember, the tragedy of Eric Dean uh, and his death in 2014. Uh, for those of you who are here with us for the first time, you know, this was a young boy uh, who was reported, you know, 15 times to authorities that he was being abused and he was beat to death. So what the response was, there's a task force that was you know, put forward by Governor Dayton with 93 recommendations of how to transform the child welfare system and quote, make sure this never happens again. But I want to folks keep in mind that this was not a task force to transform the child protection system. It was a response, uh, it was a political response to a tragedy and that framing is different. And so what we saw was a swing. We saw more intervention, more safety measures. And I think that the jury is still deciding on whether or not uh, that has improved child safety. But what we have seen as of late is an incredible increase in foster care since 2014. And we've seen that uptick. So there are currently 15,000 of our children who are under our care. Uh, that means the state is the parent for the majority of these young people. And we owe, the, owe a duty of care much stronger than we're currently providing to these children. Mr. Murphy, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, you're on a um, presenter view, I think. So some of the smaller info is a little difficult for us to see. If you could. Oh, can you not I see the main screen? Going? I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong and this is just a program that has a next slide preview, but it's okay. Keep going, I'm yeah. sorry. I can, I can swap displays. Is this better? Perfect. Okay. I didn't know which setting you all had it on, so thank you. So this should be a little bit easier. So there's 15,000 children in care. And when we're talking about race and rate, this is what we're talking about. So it is impossible to separate the conversation of race when we're talking about foster care. 
This is the graph uh, for American Indian, the rate of involvement. And I use that term because that's a federal and state definition. I know many folks would prefer Native American or indigenous. I'm um, just using the technical terms that are provided by Department of Human Services. And what we see are trends elsewhere. I'll let you all review that uh, later. So at this point, I usually like to pause because we get caught up in data. And so often then we forget about the people that are involved. And so I'd like to just provide you with a couple of quotes of people who have experienced foster care uh, and you know, have now aged out, which is that they feel like, you know, I felt like I was thrown out into the wild. It seemed like there was no path forward. I want us to think about that framing as we think about what it is, the plan for our young people when they turn 18 and they're on their own, when they turn 21 and they must live their lives without the support of largely family and the support structures that that provides. So just quickly about COVID, it's nothing has been untouched. So unemployment uh, for fosters is two times higher of the general population in the US and for fosters, it's four times higher. 21% have had living situations impacted by the pandemic. Uh, the number jumps 38% the older you get. T typically, uh, which I think is um, counterintuitive, is that things get worse as fosters get older. And that the most concerned about their future safety are 18 to 20 year olds as they face the cliff of what it means when they turn 21 and on their birthday, they must exit care and lose state support and guidance, and they are on their own. So our June survey showed that there was you know, increases of unemployment. This is a duplication, my apologies. And so there's changes in what child welfare data. Uh, so broadly, um, there's been a 22% drop in maltreatment reports this past year, and a 27% drop in investigations, um, drops in the number of youth experiencing care, the number of continuers, uh, slight decrease in disparity rates as well. There is still a significant debate on whether it's evidence of hidden child abuse or evidence of you know, over investigation in the child welfare system. Uh, I am not here to litigate that, but one thing that I want folks to really keep in mind is that this is a bubble that is going to correct. Uh, if there's a dip now, then we're going to see a correction later. Uh, this, these are things that are simply not going to go away, um, but they're going to pop back up. But when we're talking about this rate of disparities, we're talking about you know 16.8 times um, for Native American youth, 2.6 times the rate for African American and Black youth, and 5.6 times uh, their white peers for mixed race youth. And for the mixed race data, um, majority like 50% are you know, identifies one singular race being black and 50% identifies one singular race being Native American. So it's, it's fairly split and about 5% uh, identify as Asian American. But I do wanna caution that there's nothing to celebrate about this data. Just because it's down doesn't mean that, that that's good. We are still at double the federal rate entry into foster care standard. We are you know, below the federal standard and you know, requirements for monthly caseworker visits. And this was before COVID. Uh, so I want us to you know, be cognizant of that. So what happens when you age out? So right now, uh, what happens when you're aging out of foster care uh, right now is the response to COVID is that there's the 2021 Appropriations Act, which allows fosters to stay in care uh, until September 27th. And I think that's really important, something that I really wanna stress. Bulletins have been sent to counties. And so as legislators, I would really, really push you to ask your county uh, folks about this and whether or not um, there are you know, challenges to young people entering care uh, right now. So this allows you to have aged out since January 27th of last year. Uh, this is something that we pushed the you know, administration to implement a moratorium on. We were unsuccessful in that, but thankfully the federal government uh, responded and now Minnesota is complying. So this also removes the 30% cap on JP funds for housing assistance, which I think is you know, you know, really 
present in our conversation around preventing homelessness. And it also expands options for public housing authorities to allow, uh, you know, using family unification programs with like vouchers for additional 24 months uh, for foster youth. So now I'll transition to the connection to homelessness. So as I mentioned, the Venn diagram is practically a circle when we're talking about folks who have experienced care. So with 18 months of emancipation at age 18, uh, 40, 50% of foster youth will become homeless. And that history of foster care uh, correlates very strongly with becoming homeless at an earlier age and remaining homeless for a longer period of time. I think if you talk to any of the experts here today, they will agree that the biggest factor on whether or not someone is going to, you know, experience homelessness as a adult is whether or not they experience it as a child. It makes it easier. It makes it uh, less daunting to be on the street because you've been there before and you were more vulnerable when you were there first. And that 65% of our young people need immediate housing upon discharge. I want us to think about that for a second and think about your own children. They turn 18, they turn 21, you know, you kick them out of the nest and then you see them in the street. And as a state, we no longer see them as our children. We see them as adults often who have made a bad choice or as adults who are assumptions of what homeless people are um, and the choices that they have made uh, then presume. And I don't want to get in a debate about the deserving homeless or undeserving homeless. I think all of our folks deserve uh, supports and, and housing, but we do a, we hold a deep and strong duty of care to our children, more so because we separated them from their families and they became ours as a result. So Super. the impact more. We're running pretty short on time. If we could uh, add yes. a couple of questions too. So thank you. This is the final slide. So the Minnesota impact uh, more locally is that 38% of homeless youth have uh, had experiences in foster care. Um, you know, our local survey, which I have included for all of you, 79% um, of you know, the folks that we encountered uh, had experienced homelessness at some point. 14% were homeless right now. 35% had been homeless for a year or more. And 25% experienced homelessness in 2020. And 20% were currently couch surfing, sleeping in the car, or on the street at the time of our survey. Thank you so much, Mr. Murphy, for yep. this information. Um, I wanted to go to Representative Keeler. Got a question or comment? I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Murphy, for this information. Um, so first I wanna ask, as you do your work with foster care, um, can you explain to me um, how that aligns with ICWA? and how you're implementing the federal ICWA guidelines. Um, it really, I'm gonna be really transparent. It's a little, I looked through all the slides that you sent. I've looked through your website. I looked through everything and you utilize the data to highlight the fact that, um, you know, in Minnesota, we really struggle with our indigenous population. You know, we're number one in the nation for Native American um, youth being removed, yet there's no conversation around ICWA and the federal guidelines and how that comes into play with some of the outlining work that we need to do. Mr. Murphy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Representative Keeler, you know, I just want to stress that, you know, Minnesota is the worst in the country when it comes to Native American outcomes uh, and impact of child welfare for the state. I think that's something that we should be deeply ashamed about and something that we should do significant work around to help address uh, that, you know, when we're, when we're talking about Native American communities, we're talking about a community that one fifth of that population has had, had a experience in child welfare. That is unacceptable uh, by any degree or, or measure. Um, but I do want to name that, you know, as a nonprofit and separate agency, we don't have any particular ICWA um, guidance that we would issue, but we would strongly encourage that, you know, folks better align with, you know, ICWA and NIFPA, the Minnesota Related Law, uh, and enforce it fully. Um, I guess I would just like to say that as part of that work, you know, one thing that we want to keep in mind is that this is why it's so important to hear from fosters, because the experience of Native, Native American foster youth is going to be very different than the experiences of maybe other fosters or even homelessness, right? That when you experience care, you're experiencing a government intervention already. And that intervention, while maybe life-saving, 
and life affirming in many aspects, then has an end. Families generally don't stop caring for their children just because they turn 18 or just because they turn 21. And that's something that the state does. Um, okay, I don't have any follow up. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Keeler. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the pres presentation, Mr. Uh, Murphy. My question is on the race and rate slide. Um, well, to Representative Keeler's point, I mean, the numbers for, for our Native population are horrifying. Um, but the only one that I see decreasing over that period of time is among the black population. And that actually decreased kind of significantly. Do you know what is to account for that? Were there specific policies that were put in place to help in that community? Um, what, would it, what would account for that? That seems to be the only uh, group that actually decreased. Mr. Murphy? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so when we're talking about that, pop, like the African American population data, what we're seeing is like, you know, a trend we're down that's very slight. One thing that I want to keep in mind, though, is that when we're talking about disparities in foster care, we're talking about the over representation and under representation. And so a disparity can be reduced um, with, with the population data never changing if more white children are entering the foster care system. So if we see an increase overall of involvement, but a stable um, for white families, but then a stable one for black families, then we're gonna see a decrease in disparities. That does not mean we are improving. That just simply means that we are, you know, that more white children are entering care. Uh, but one of the biggest aspects of this is also that uh, as a society, we are having more mixed race communities. And so they are now choosing to identify as mixed race as opposed to just identifying as one. So you will see that the mixed race population has significantly increased. Representative New Berlin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, you're right. I mean, it looks like those lines basically traded places. So, okay, thank you for the explanation. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thanks again, Mr. Murphy, for this presentation. Really appreciate the information and all of your work um, with this community. Um, so finally on the agenda, we have an informational hearing on House File 2371. Um, so this is a bill that I authored, but since it's an informational hearing, well, I'm just gonna kind of present it. Um, the Homeless Youth Act Fund was created in 2006 and it awards grants to providers who are committed to serving homeless youth and youth at risk of homelessness. Um, provides uh, street and community outreach and drop-in programs or supports those programs, supports emergency shelter programs, integrative supportive housing and transitional living programs to reduce the incidence of homelessness among youth. Um, the 2371 increases the appropriation to this program by 10 million over the biennium, 5 million a year. Um, I just wanted to mention that as part of the original Homeless Youth Act, there's a biennial report that is submitted to the legislature. And I think Mr. Herring emailed the latest one, the 2019 one out to everybody. I found it really uh, helpful. I felt like some of the information that we want about other programs we have about this program, like who's it going to, what are they doing with the money, kind of that stuff. So, uh, so please take a look at that. Um, we're a little strapped for time, so I'm going to go to our author testifiers, and then I'll kind of fill in if there's uh, stuff I think they missed, but we're really um, lucky to be joined by a bunch of great uh, subject matter experts and direct service providers today, as well as some impacted folks. Um, so first, uh, Beth Holger, who's this, I, I don't know if, if it's a hard or soft G, I'm sorry, uh, it, the CEO of The Link and co-chair of the Youth Services Network. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. You can go ahead um, whenever you're ready. Ms. Holder. Can everyone see the screen okay? Okay, 
and I'll try to get this to, okay. Thank you so much, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Beth Holger and I serve as the CEO of The Link, which is a youth and adult led nonprofit based in North Minneapolis, serving the seven county metro area. We provide juvenile justice alternative programs, services, shelter, and housing for young people who experience sex trafficking or who are experiencing homelessness along with young families. I'm also here today representing the Youth Services Network, which is a statewide coalition of youth serving agencies. I just wanted to give you a brief background on the issue of youth homelessness and the Homeless Youth Act before passing this along to the amazing four testifiers I, I have the privilege to be alongside today. Let's see here. So first of all, just wanted to let you know, I know that there's been a lot of numbers thrown at you, but on any given night, there are 6,000 young people who are unaccompanied on their own experiencing homelessness in our state, compared to just 111 dedicated youth emergency shelter beds and 734 units of housing. It also is a huge racial justice and LGBTQ justice issue. I don't wanna repeat any points, but just wanna say that there are huge disparities among those young who are experiencing homelessness as a young person versus the general youth population, both in terms of their sexual orientation, gender identity, and race. Reasons why young people are experiencing homelessness are some similar in some ways to adults, but there's many unique reasons to why young people are experiencing homelessness, including, but are not limited to, they might be kicked out by a parent or caregiver due to conflict, abuse, or because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. The parent or caregiver is unable to care for their child due to their own mental health or chemical dependency issues. Their parent or caregiver is in jail or in treatment or is deployed in the military and the young person has no one else that they can stay with. The youth might have fallen through the cracks of the child welfare system or as um, Mr. Murphy and others have spoken to, may have aged out of the foster care or juvenile justice system without any stable housing or without anywhere to go. Last but not least, sometimes parents or caregivers are doing the best they can, but they can only afford a, an apartment or housing that can fit a certain number of people. And then the landlord finds out that if they have more than that number living there, the, the oldest um, of the youth is usually asked to leave versus the entire family losing their housing. Last but not least, I wanna leave you with some hope because we have worked very hard over the years. The Homeless Youth Act was designed by youth experiencing homelessness and those of us on the front lines back in 1999. Since then, we have been advocating really hard and are so thankful for your ongoing support. But this is what will prevent youth homelessness. It provides prevention funds. It also provides all the intervention funds as well. And it's something that can make and does make a huge impact. So we are asking you to double the impact to raise the, the funding from 11.238 million a biennium to 10 million because um, these are faces of young people that are transitioning out of homelessness and that have gotten their first keys to their apartments, shared with their permission, of course. Um, another young person in the lobby taking a selfie to post on social media after he moved into his first place. And last but not least, our young people deserve our support. They're amazing, they're resilient, they are experiencing homelessness for no reason of their own, and we need to support them because they have so much contributions to give. And I have the high honor of meeting several of them. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleagues um, and just thank you for your support in hearing us out today. And at this point, I will turn you on to an esteemed colleague in the field, um, Executive Director of YouthLink, Dr. Heather Hughesby. Thank you, can you hear me? I just wanna make sure you can hear me. Yep, we've got you, Dr. Hughesby. Please Thank you. introduce yourself and proceed. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, my name is um, Heather Hughesby, and I'm Executive Director of Youth Lincoln. Like I said, I've been the Executive Director. I've been fortunate to be the Executive Director for the last 16 years. Um, I just want chair and um, members, thank you for having me. Um, I am, um, I, Dr. Foldis um, has been doing this study at Youth Link of the 1,451 youth. Um, but since that time, um, Youth Link, um, youth Link um, has been serving, um, we serve over 1,700 youth unduplicated a year. We're located at 41 North 12th Street in Minneapolis. We've been in existence for over 45 years. Um, we have the main drop-in center at YouthLink. We have housing. 
um, and we provide services that um, our goal is to get youth to believe in themselves and to transform and get back onto a pathway of education, um, employment, and to become stabilized and hopefully to take our jobs uh, in the future and um, to be able to live, um, take and seize their own opportunities in life. Um, recently, um, one of the things that we're doing is that we're involving lived experience youth in our programming and having them have the voice in what their needs are in our programming. I just wanted to correct a couple things. Um, one of the things is that 90% of our youth are youth uh, black and brown youth. And um, they um, really are have been that we've had that statistic for a number of years. Um, we're working right now on having the youth define our strategic plan and what the needs are for the future. Um, and what they defined as their reason for homelessness, I want to just clarify, is that one of the number one reasons is family trauma. Um, the trauma that they've had in their life with, um, with homelessness, with, with their families. The second really is mental health issues, um, the significant mental health issues they've had. Um, and their financial and their economic opportunities that they faced in life and the pressures that they've faced in society themselves. And the next is finding housing, getting jobs. And they've tried to address those, those issues, um, to take to addressing those issues. Um, um, and um, so we, our job is to get them to believe in themselves and take on their own, what they have in their hands and to be able to make, to get hope. Um, today, we have some wonderful um, opportunities to hear from a youth. And I think that's the most important thing that they can, that, so that we can hear from them. But as Dr. Foldis said that um, over the years, we've brought success to youth and we've been able to invest in take advantage of that business opportunity to serve youth. And so we're pleased to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hughesby, for your testimony. Um, next up, we're going to go to Jordan Johnson. Welcome to the uh, committee. Please introduce yourself and go ahead. Great. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, thank you for taking the time to be with us this morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Jordan Johnson. I'm the executive director of Lifehouse, uh, located in Duluth and we work in the Northeast region of Minnesota. Uh, we work with homeless youth ages 14 to 24 who disproportionately represent indigenous, African-American and youth of color, as well as our lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender com uh, community members. We have a drop-in youth center, a housing program, mental health and wellness program and a futures program. In 2019, we served 931 youth and last year we served 800 unduplicated youth with 65% who identified as youth of color and 20% self-identified as LGBTQ. I also want to highlight that 59% of our young people experience violence and or abuse, as well as 47% are struggling with a mental illness. And this one last telling statistic I want you to keep in mind, which has been brought up uh, this morning, is 47% of our young females are pregnant and or parenting. So we are working with our future generations and witness daily the challenges of youth and young families face. Whether it be accessing a safe shelter to rest their head or a supportive housing environment, we see the physical, mental, and emotional impact of their lived realities. And unfortunately, many of our youth have learned how to survive in an unstable, unhealthy, and harmful environment. In a few moments, um, you will hear from more about the power and the beauty and impact of work happening with young people. Uh, when a youth becomes housed or utilizes our wraparound supportive services, we watch them flourish because they know someone is by their side, no matter what is happening in their life. They have a place to be who they are and connect with someone who cares for them. And because of your commitment over the years with our homeless youth, uh, our community has made progress. Yet, our work is far from over. Um, we need dependable funding and programmatic support if we are going to interrupt the intergenerational cycles of poverty, homelessness, and trauma. And so thank you for your time today and the work you do to support our homeless and struggling youth across the state. And I will turn it over to our young people. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Johnson. Next, uh, LaRonda Bryan. Good morning and thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. 
My name is LaRonda Bird, and I am the Northside Prevention Coordinator at The Link, which is a culturally specific program that serves youth and families in North Minneapolis. With housing disparities at an all-time high, we must continue advocacy for more housing and sustainability. North Minneapolis has one of the highest rates of eviction in the 55411 and 55412 area codes. Last year, the North Pro Northside Prevention Program assisted 60 youth and families in North Minneapolis to get into housing and maintain housing and avoid evictions. 95% of youth and families served were African American. Once a youth has stable housing, they can focus on different areas in their life, such as education, employment, as well as mental health and physical health needs. Having access to programs in the community is imperative. If we want to continue to reach youth and families, we have to end homelessness. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Bird. I'm sorry that I mispronounced your name. I had like the Y and the R switched on my, on my list. Oh, no worries. So we appreciate it. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. Um, next up, LaRonda Lake. Hello. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is LaRonda Lake, and I am one of the Lynx Youth Advisory Committees and Leaders and a staff at the Lynx uh, Linquist Apartment Housing Program, the same program I used to live in, but I'll get into that more in a minute. Um, why I became homeless, uh, the cycle started with my mom and her homelessness, as long as I can remember we were homeless. Um, you know, moving place to place, uh, her friends, shelters. I don't know if you guys remember or ladies, um, the 410 or the Drake Hotel. When I was really young, I used to live there for a long time. Um, to her having her own place a few times, but due to her mental health um she couldn't cope with the bills and things like that and she would have many of people that would come live with us and um with that being said they would be sexually abusive they would be on drugs you know um emotional we didn't go to the school often when we did go to school we had dirty clothes and that sort of thing so the state started to investigate and she wouldn't show up to courts so um once we went to the court, I was at the age of six where they took us away from my mother. And uh, my first placement was uh, St. Joseph's. From there, we went to like three different foster homes before my dad um, finally got custody of us and he became physically abusive. And the most hurtful thing that I could remember is nobody would listen to us that we were being abused by our father until, um, you know, the school found out. And um, from that point, they were just like, well, we have to get you out. Um, my sister, she lied and said my dad never hit her because she was so afraid that he would find us again. And, um, you know, that was really tough to go through. But what was even tougher was having to go and start that the more like more trauma of foster care. I was 10 years old, you know, um, also switched around from residential treatment centers, Wyluson Academy, Gerard Academy. And um, it was just like, nobody heard me, nobody understood me. And I was just like, who can I talk to? Where can I go? You know, um, I was adopted at least five different times in and out of, you know, um, hospitals because they thought, you know, my mental wasn't the best, which it wasn't only due to the circumstances of I wasn't heard. You know, in order to get attention, it wasn't the best attention, but it was attention. So, um, oh, excuse me. Um, from that point on, you know, being in that of foster care, being to group homes, you just kind of give up. At this point, where do I go with my life? Nobody believes me, I have nobody to talk to. Um, so the last foster home that they took me out of, which she was supposed to be a potential um, adopted, she ended up dropping me off at a shelter because they said that she didn't know how to handle me. 
and that was like through a black um, adoption agency, but she was really nice. She listened to me. My mental health was good. I wasn't selling in school. So right when I found somebody that actually heard me, they took her. And it was just like all over again from the, you know, six years old, I'm getting taken away from my mom again. So where do I go? So um, the last minute I was turning 17, 18, at that point, things start to speed up. I was, was in extended foster care, getting a stipend of 800 a month. Um, that only lasted long because they didn't tell me about the stipend until I was at least 20 and you had to be working or in school. And they didn't tell me this until I was 20. So that wouldn't have lasted long. Um, well, from that point, it was just like, okay, we need to get you out back to that store. We need to get you out. They put me with my sister. My sister thinking that um, she would get receive money from me from the state. She immediately got rid of me afterwards. So that's where the actual homelessness started to take place. And um, I was just on the street, fall into a lot of things, but I thank God that I didn't fall into drugs. You know, um, I've always had my head on right, and I always knew what I wanted in life. I just needed the encouragement and the support. So um, a lot of the time, yes, I went to Youth Link. I would take showers. I would eat. I would get any resources that I needed, such as my health. I actually, um, and shout out to Jason. He really helped me. He was the, he's the GED uh, person and he helped me pass my GED because I used to study and, you know, whatever he said to do, I was on it. So um, from there, it was just kind of like my life started to go up right before um, I got in touch with the link. Like I said, I was a client, but before that, um, I did, you know, my mental health got the best of me and I was homeless and I tried to, you know, harm myself and I ended up in a coma for three and a half weeks. And at that time I was seeing a therapist and I didn't know that my therapist got in touch with the link. So at that time, I didn't even know I had a housing ready for me. I didn't know I had a team of people that was ready and willing to give me that support and that encouragement and just that family setting that I always wanted and needed. Um, I stopped being homeless or my homelessness and my stability began March 15, 2017. Um, I was in that program for a year. And while in that program, they helped me with my confidence. They've helped me with the stability, which was really huge for someone like me. And just I, words can't explain how happy I am because now I work with the link. Um, I haven't been homeless since 2017. If you ever have any issues, I can call Beth up. I can call anyone up and they be like, oh, we got you. We right there for you. And that's just, that's what's helping me is that they're rooting for me and, you know, um, I'm driving out, got my own car, which I couldn't do that in foster care. So I'm just doing a lot of stuff that I didn't have the chance to do. And to get back to them, I'm doing me and I'm working as hard as I can to accomplish my, you know, my goals in this life. Um, my next goal is to continue. And um, I started school next week, hopefully when the guy gets back from his vacation, I can start going back to school and uh, further my education and doing and working in human services, just so the next generation have someone that is there for them and they don't have to go through this. And like, you know, uh, Representative Goldman said, you know, to prevent it earlier, this is what we have to do. And this is, you know, this is where we step in that and give them that. So that um, cycle and the generational cursing of not having someone there or, you know, just mentally in the support and everything, they have someone there that helps them and further their life. And their life doesn't have to be what it used to be with their family and it stops at them, you know? So, um, thank you. Um, I think I'm supposed to do something else.
<laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you for hearing me today. And um, oh, what I already said why is it important, but yeah, just to continue this kind of um, you know, cycle and just continue to help us grow because we deserve it and we're the gen next generation. So who knows, someone might be in you guys' footsteps and have that ability to help someone. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, uh, Ms. Lake, um, for your openness and for sharing your story with us and um, for allowing us to hear you. And I can tell you, you're right, you do have your head on straight and I'm so glad that you are getting the support that you need um, in your life. Thank you so much. Um, Representative Keeler had a comment or a question. I do, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Lake, um, I want to let you know that we see you and we hear you. Um, and I think you said, you know, that one day someone might step up and I just really believe that you are one of those someones. Um, I think that we, we hear a lot about historical trauma and we hear a lot about like this cycle of generational trauma and that, you know, we end up in the same elements as generations before us and your resilience and your passion and your grit um, does not go unnoticed. And I think in these spaces, um, we have to recognize the human part of this, that yes, financial investment is massive and we need that, but we have to create um, a space where we trust and we believe our kids um, because you're, you're not alone in this story. And the work that I've done, I've heard this over and over and over that it takes so long for kids to be put in safe spaces. And then the spaces we think we're moving them into are not that safe. And so we need to trust and hear our youth. And I'm just so proud of you. Um, I know that this space is a weird space, right? Like we're virtual and you've gone through so much and I just couldn't pass up the opportunity to tell you that we see you, I see you. Um, and I really believe that you are somebody who is gonna make a massive difference and a change. And like, I look forward to seeing that. Um, so continue to work on it. I'm excited for you to go to school. I do just have one question. You said that you got your GED and I'm so proud of you for that. Um, how old were you when you received your GED? I wanna say I was about 25. Okay. Um, yeah, due to moving so much, they lost my ninth grade records. So yep. um, instead of giving up, I went back for myself because right. I was like, I can't be what my family is. And I wanna show my nieces and nephews that there is something better to life than, you know, having not as much. Instead of, you know, uh, surviving, you wanna live your life. So that was one of my gift for them and, you know, continue to show them that there's more, mm -hmm. for sure. Madam Chair, one more, sorry. Yeah, Representative Keeler, go ahead. Um, I appreciate that. And I, and I think that it highlights, you know, the concerns that we have in education systems too. And as people move, you know, we know that every move we lose, you know, six to eight weeks of education, but also we lose information and important information to continue um, for people to grow. So I really appreciate you sharing your story today. Um, and again, I, I look forward to the massive things you are gonna do in your community and your state and probably nationally. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Keeler. Uh, Representative Cagle. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just kind of wanted to circle back a bit too because it sounds like um, Ms. Lake, um, this cycle ends with you, right? And so, um, you know, to Representative Petersburg's point earlier about, you know, the family interventions and how we stabilize families, this is how we do it. Because in your future, you'll have a stable family, whatever that family looks like, um, whether, you know, it's a chosen family or biological family, um, but that will, um, these services make it so that your children or your family won't have to go through the same things that you went through. And so I really see these interventions as a way to stabilize future generations and make sure that, you know, not only you will have a bright future, but your kids or your, you know, nieces and nephews or however, you know, whatever your family looks like in the future, um, 
And so excited to see that. And I hope we get to uh, see you around the Capitol much more in coming years and um, kind of wish that we were in person so we could give each other hugs. I, I'm not a hugger, but man, boy, do I miss hugs, right? <laughs> so um, just really want to thank you. Thank you. And I'll give you a spiritual hug. I'm with there. I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need like a spiritual group hug right now, you guys. Right. Um, <laughs> Especially with COVID. Oh my yeah, exactly. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. Um, I don't see any further um, member questions or comments. Um, you know, what more could I say to support the necessity of this funding than what has been said in today's hearing? I just want to express my profound gratitude to everybody for your work in this important area. Um, and, you know, to Ms. Lake in particular for, for sharing your story. Um, as Representative Keeler said, we see you and we hear you and we appreciate you and all the work that you're doing. And it matters a lot that, you're, that it's ending with you. Thank you so much. Um, so, excuse me, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so we are on break next week. And the week after that, our normal meeting time will be April 7th. We're going to be in touch because we're kind of like in this weird part of session where, you know, we're we're figuring out kind of uh, we're going to have longer sessions and um, we're going to be dealing with our omnibus bills. So we'll just we'll be in touch with folks about the plan for the committee moving forward after our break. And I hope everybody gets some rest next week. Thank you so much for being here. And we are adjourned. <laughs>